everyone, Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Midwifery Business Consultation. This next section of our regulatory course has to do with the birth center side. It's a little simpler than the midwifery regulations, so um, it's more of just learning your state guidelines. There's not like an international certification, a national, a state, and then a local private. So this one is a little bit easier. So as the same as last time and every disclaimer that I put on my courses, I want you to understand your, your state, your local, your unique needs. So get the best of the best on your team, get some accountants, lawyers, and local experts. I don't have that direct degree. I am teaching based on the knowledge, the skills, the resources I have at my fingertips and things change. So I'm not making any guarantee. I try to make things as accurate as possible, um, but you want to just make sure that everything we're teaching you, you meet with the local experts to make sure it works for your unique needs. So the objectives of this presentation is to really just understand what is a birth center. I get a lot of questions and consults. They like the idea of creating a birth center, but then they want to add things into it that aren't really traditionally part of a birth center. So it's a big educational opportunity of what is a birth center. You have to remember there's a lot of places across the country where labor and delivery units are called birth centers and the the especially certified nurse midwives they've only seen the labor and delivery unit model they've truly never seen a birth center so it's a harder concept for them to grasp and so that's why it's really important to have these education and really stress on a national level what is a birth center what is not a birth center what is included in a birth center i've worked at facilities where it's been the other directions, physicians were trying to make mini hospitals for maybe state reimbursement or wanted control more, or whatever the extent is, they didn't want maxi homes, they wanted mini hospitals. So I think it's really, really important for us to talk about what truly is a birth center, what are the regulations look like, because every state is different, how is a birth center implemented? influenced by the midwifery model of care, um, the five key P descriptions of birth centers and the national standard and those resources you can go to. If you're considering starting a birth center, I love helping midwives do that. And then we send you some really awesome resources. There's the AABC, there's CABC, depending on if you want national certification on top of your state licensure. So, and there's pros and cons to doing both of those. So what is the definition of a birth center? It is truly a healthcare facility for where a woman goes to birth her babies and it's influenced and prophesied by the midwifery model of care. So it tends to be homey, it tends to be normal focused. Um, with my birth center, we had so much fun. We literally took a house that a chiropractor had commercialized and the layout was perfect. We redid a couple of the back bedrooms into gorgeous just birth room. So we had custom tubs put in, we had the open layout, we had a fireplace, we had just that warm, comfy feel. You want women to come into your birth center with their families and take a big, deep breath sigh when they walk in that they're relaxed, they're comfortable. This is a place I want to birth. I always talk it's like a fancy bed and breakfast. Um, you don't want it to feel too medicalized. You want this a medical equipment round, but you want it more concealed. You want it more of a normal approach. You want to balance out the medical interventions to be available and embracing birth as a normal process. So they're typically freestanding. I've seen it a few times where there's separate units within the hospital that they get accredited on a national and state level as a birth center. But most of the time, it's a freestanding building that's either across from a hospital or within 30 minutes of a hospital. We want to stress that birth centers are integrated part of the bigger healthcare system. You don't want to be just a solo cowgirl fighting the fight. And then if something is happening, then you get involved in the, the physicians and the hospital system and those transports, because that's when safety starts becoming an issue. So whenever you create your policies, your protocols, your mission and values, you want to be closely connected with the healthcare and the higher acuity resources, but acknowledging you're only going to use them if you need them versus they're routinely part of your care. 
So the philosophy at a birth center, it respects and it facilitates women's rights, which is very similar to the midwifery model. And that's why most birth centers are started and ran by midwives. There are a few um, state regulations where you have to have a physician medical director. There's birth centers started by physicians because they absolutely love midwifery model of care. Um, so it doesn't really necessarily mean who owns it and who directly works at it, but the core philosophy is that physiological approach and it's closely integrated with the bigger healthcare system. So I wanted to give you some pictures because I think pictures speak louder than words of these gorgeous birth centers all over the country and you're going to notice a consistent theme. There's not ex there's not hospital beds, there's not stirrups, um, there's not bright lights, there's not, um, it's a home-like environment. These are routine queen beds and gorgeous big tubs to deliver in. Um, birth centers a lot of times will do water births, hospital births tend to not do water births and so um, having that home-like feel is really really important for the birth center theme. So here's another gorgeous birth center and you're going to see it's a tub, it's a it's a room, it's spacious, she can move around, sometimes there's different equipment present, um, but you want them to feel as comfortable as possible. They're going from their home to your home. So here's another one. It, it, sometimes the tubs are in the middle of the room, sometimes they're in a corner, but it's a consistent theme. It's a bedroom, it's a family feel, it's a home-like environment. So these are different areas that birth occurs in the United States in the different people that attend it. So as you'll see in the hospital setting, it's mostly physicians and nurse midwives practice in hospital setting. Um, so other midwives in the hospital, that 17.2% typically is certified midwives and there's a few states where certified professional midwives have hospital privileges. Um, and then you'll notice for freestanding birth centers that it tends to be the other midwives, which are certified professional midwives midwives, lay midwives, direct entry midwives, um, and then there's a few nurse midwives that practice in birth centers and home births. So I just wanted you guys to get a good sense that most freestanding birth centers across the country tend to be that quote unquote statistic other midwives that will be catching the babies. So birth center regulations, there are national accreditations, there's national guidelines, but most states now, and there's just a few that are left, have some form of regulations on the facility. How do you differentiate? You're not applying for a hospital facility, a surgical center. You are applying to create a birth center. What do I have to do in that state to get the license to upkeep it? What are the policies need to look like, what are the mission, the the zoning, the layout of the building. You're not, when you look at a birth center facility, the instinct of a midwife when we're designing it is to look at how beautiful the room is, the color on the walls, the themes, the, the, the interior designing, but a good chunk of the birth center regulations is the safety component. Are your hallways wide enough? Is there enough fire um, hazard protections? If you're in a high tornado zone, what are the safety measures in place? If EMS has to come in quickly and support your, um, your woman that is birthing, how can they safely get into that room and get her on a cart? And so those are the things a lot of birth center regulations are looking at is what equipment do you have present? How are you training your staff? How are you keeping up with competencies? A lot of the quality, a lot of the skills, safety is ultimately everyone's goal. So a lot of the birth center regulations, they're not going to tell you how to paint the room. They're going to tell you the minimum size of the room, the hallway, um, the fire extinguishers, the um, checking of the safety components of your facility. And so it's really important if you're considering starting a birth center as a midwife, are you in a state that has birth center regulations? If they don't, it's a lot harder to get insurance reimbursement. So are the families willing to pay cash or are you in a state that only physicians can start birth centers? And so I don't want you to just instantly jump into something. I want you to look at the state regulations of places you may practice and what does it take for that birth center to be opened and maintained in that local area. 
So these are some of the things to think about when you're talking about the birth center model with the midwifery rule, you want a good continuity of care. So I love seeing midwifery birth centers having family nurse practitioners where the, the babies pass the first month and the husbands can be seen. You have that full scope community feel to it versus as soon as she's done having a baby, you send her somewhere else for GYN care, the baby is seen by your practice the first month and then it's a pediatrician or another family practice office um, and being able to practice to the most autonomous level of our our scope is so so important because you have a lot of barriers for safety if there's restrictions on your birth center regulations or your midwifery regulations um, looking at your guidelines to practice you want to make sure that they're up to date that they cover all those what-if situations and you want to have clearly, so when you hire a new staff and you aren't there all the time, everybody has an accountability of what is the standard of care and what's expected of them. Like even the simplest things of cleaning that tub and sterilizing your instruments is so, so important for safety and quality improvements. Um, having a good work-life balance. I mean, being a home birth midwife has a lot more demands on you being in multiple places at once versus a birth center, you can have your prenatal visits down the hallway, you can have two, three birth rooms, you could have a couple ladies at the same time where you have some great birth assistants helping you with labor support. Um, it does tend to with birth centers in a single location that women are birthing, um, a little easier on the midwifery demands. And then an effective working relationship. You want to work closely with physicians, with specialists, with the healthcare system, your EMS team. Um, you want to have conversations. You want to have meetings before there's a problem. Making your policies, having a clear expectation. I mean, even the simplest things of who to call and what door to go in a hospital that's down the street when it's weekends and nights versus calling 911. Like those are important things. If minutes matter, you really really want good outcomes in the end and you don't want these simple things based on a flow of different departments and who to call for what to be barriers of time. So there's five P's when you look at the birth center model. You want to look at the people, you want to look at the place, you want to look at the type of program, um, the practice of midwifery and making sure it's part of the bigger healthcare system. So the people you want to look at, you are taking care of healthy, low-risk women. We don't have an OR down the hall. We don't do vacuums. We don't do inductions. We don't take preterm ladies. We don't take post-dates inductions. Typically, we don't do V-backs. We don't do twins and breaches based on each state regulations. But I'm just doing a generalized. We take care of low-risk, healthy women based on national standards. And so we want to know who are the people. And the nice thing is most of the women in the community are that good candidate for birth centers and out of hospital midwifery service. So you want to look at the staff. What's the qualifications? If you're going to hire certified professional midwives, direct entry, nurse midwives, if you're going to have nurses, medical assistants, birth assistants, what is the training and what professional liability insurance do you want to consider having for your birth center facility, for your business, for your professional practice so that you can protect your hard-earned assets short-term and long-term. And the people it's looking at who are qualified obstetricians and pediatricians in your community that you would love to create a long-term relationship with this cross-referral, knowing that your families are going to get continued care in someone that has a very similar philosophy to what you do. So it's the place. We stress it's a maxi home. It's not a mini hospital. Um, you don't want a triage room. You don't want hotel doors down the hallway of other specialists, you want a home-like environment. She walks in, it feels spa-like, it's comforting, the kids can play in the waiting area, um, it's relaxed, it's inviting. You want them to feel safe and calm and comforted that this is a place they would like to birth their children. Um, you want to make sure the place is safe. You want to make sure it's kept up to codes. If you consider buying a building, what's the electrical work, what's the water, what's 
the foundation. You want to make sure this building is safe because if there's old electrical and it's not maintained, it's a higher chance of fire. Um, is this building set up as a medical building or is it a beautiful Victorian home that used to be a bed and breakfast and that gorgeous spiral staircase isn't going to be very good for um, EMS. So there's a lot of state regulations for birth centers. If you have multiple levels, you're going to have to have a handicapped accessible elevator. So those are things to think about when you're looking at different birth center locations and knowing your state regulations really, really well. Um, understanding what equipment is is present for a birth center at a hospital delivery is very, very different than in a hospital. Hospitals have to, with an EMTALA, be ready for anything that comes through the door, high risk, low risk, anything. We are a private practice. We are not held to EMTALA. Our equipment, our standards, our training, our emergency procedures are set up for low risk, healthy women. Um, it's a freestanding facility. You could be right across from a hospital or you could be up to 30 minutes from a hospital. Um, but you want to have policies and protocols for transport, for collaboration. Even though you're freestanding, you tend to be private, not part of the bigger system as employment, you still want to be closely connected with those other healthcare facilities because that's what makes good outcomes. So the program, the philosophy, when women come through the door, your initial prenatal visit is probably going to be very different than if she came in for a physician's midwifery practice in a hospital setting. They traditionally will have the nurse do the first visit and then the midwife or physician will do the follow-up visits. For the birth center feel, it's the midwife doing most of the care. They're doing most of the education. They're doing that hour, hour and a half initial prenatal visit. They're doing the orientations, a lot of the accreditation accreditation birth center accreditations requires them to attend a couple childbirth educations. Maybe it's a meet the midwives at the beginning before they enroll and do their first prenatal visit or actually attending their childbirth education course before they deliver. Those are part of a lot of the AABC guidelines, CABC, and many state regulations talk about how important these educational programs are to be part of your policies and standard expectations. Um, during pregnancy, what are you offering for continuous screenings? When are there physicals? When are the routine labs offered? Are you doing those labs in-house? Do you refer out for them? What health screenings do you do and offer? Do you, can you order mammograms? Do you do pap smears? Do you do routine breast exams and well woman care? Or do you refer out for that service? Do you plan on participating with the whole family in the care or do you make it more about just the woman focus? Do you accept their insurance? Is it cash? What is the program? What is the philosophy? I know with birth centers, we traditionally, it's a full family event. We want the mom, we want the aunts, we want the partner, we want the kids. We tend to make it a very family oriented process if that's what the woman desires. I've had the other direction where women Women want very private, they want to just be her and a partner and quiet and peaceful, so we respect those birth choices. The educational program, a lot of self-care, a lot of preventative medicine, and a lot of preventative counseling, we tend to not be about let's treat and cover up symptoms, let's get to the root of the cause and the problem of what's going on. And it's mind, body, soul. It's so socioeconomical. There's a lot of barriers when we're trying to figure out how can we serve families better. We're looking at a lot of multidisciplinary directions. So other parts of the program, um, obviously when you're on call for birth, you need to have a policy of 24 seven availability. Um, we traditionally don't do call service, answering services. We are as midwives, we rotate either a team or solo, being the answering service 24 seven for families. So it's really important to have clear expectations and to have that written and availability. So a lot of birth center regulations require you to have a policy noting you're available 24 seven for families. We take it for granted. We think, duh, that's an obvious one, but it has to be written. It has to be recognized with state regulations. Um, what are you doing for follow-up newborn testing? Um, what parts of the scope are the midwives doing? What do you refer out? Um, um, 
having during the actual labor there is a midwife there is a physician that's actively present in the building either in the room at all times and it may be a birth assistant or a nurse that's doing a good chunk of the labor support if you're in another room but you have to have in your policies that that person is on site because that's the skilled care provider and labor um, tends to be where those rare high risk things happen so you want to really be supportive with parenting and breastfeeding. You can have classes and promoting normalcy, promoting birth as a normal process, the family bonding, the breastfeeding resources. We really want to emphasize normal with our program, our mission, and our philosophy. So I'm not going to talk too much of the practice of midwifery because we did a really good job with that on the other slide. I'm just going to talk high level. The philosophy of midwifery is so complemented with a birth center model. We embrace normal, we embrace family, we embrace um, team decision making, preventative, birth is a normal process and that has a complement it flows over to your policies with the birth center to your decision making what type of clients you're going to serve what philosophy what branding you want to put out into the community is a mere image of the practice of midwifery so practice like of the system as a whole we want to be integral what services are you going to determine are directly part of your practice what parts are you going to resource out when we as midwives choose to open a birth center it's just as important for us to know our skills as it is what we don't have our skills do you have a list do you have connections do you know people in the area to send them to for counseling social work intimate partner violence safety issues um, there's an unusual mole on her arm do you know a great dermatologist to send her to um, you just did a breast exam and there's some suspicious lump then she has a strong family history of cancer you want to know the best of the best in the area that you can send your families to so it's really important to have us be the first line gateway to a lot of low-risk healthy families starting out being seen by the bigger system and we want to be the gateway to get them to the other great parts so other parts when you're part when you're doing the system you want to write your policies to reinforce quality to follow up to build a relationship you want to work really hard on good networking opportunities chiropractors are phenomenal doulas childbirth educators lactation consultants consultants the list goes on and on it's going to be a double part you want to improve your outcomes of cross referral and learning from these other people um, the chiropractor has a wealth of knowledge to help with nausea and migraines and um, back discomforts in pregnancy I mean acupuncture is phenomenal so we want to learn from each other and we also want to know when does it make sense to send someone to that that person and their skill set or this is out, outside of the scope of a midwife, I would like you to see my amazing obstetrician colleague. Or you know this baby has a higher bilirubin, has a higher jaundice, that first postpartum visit than I am comfortable with. I would like to know a great pediatrician that I can get you into today versus your answer is just sending them to the mainstream ER system. And that may not be the best place for a brand new baby to go day one postpartum. So this is a great map um, from 2019 of the different birth center regulations. So as we talked about in past slides, 80% of the states have regulations at this point. Um, there's some that are pending regulations and most of them do. And some are restrictive. Some require a medical director. Some require a written consulting relationship with a physician or a hospital or a pediatrician. And some are more autonomous that it's a close informal relationship you are you are creating where it's written in your policies this is your go-to person versus you have to in writing that person is going to take your transfers or continue that integral part of the relationship so you just want to learn your state really well and there's goods and bads of the states that don't have regulations you can truly make a home into a birth center because it is a home away from home, but you have a lot of barriers with insurance reimbursement. So you need to think about your business plan and figuring out your fee schedules and financial long-term strengths 
Each state has different overhead costs. Some supplies are required in some locations and aren't in others. There, so you really have to know your state and what is required. And when you're making your business plan and wanting to start a birth center, it, it's so, so important you have your state birth center regulations memorized if they exist. So national standards for birth centers, there's two main organizations you want to go to for resources and from learning. The American Association of Birth Center is more of a set of national resources and guidelines to help states that don't have regulations and are working on making them or maybe they're updating their guidelines. This is the national go-to association people will use to figure out what is the standards for birth centers. Commissions of Accredited Birth Center is more of the national certification process. Some states require you to have CABC licensure on top of state licensure, and some states don't require it. So that's something you have to look at with your practice. It's a reinforcing credibility. If the state only requires you to have a state license, this national certification you would be doing that benefit risk analysis financially, more credibility into the community. It's just just a next level of these are the standards that I have hit, I've had these audits, I've had these quality checks in place so that consumers can feel more confident that you really know what you're doing and you've set it up to the national standards. So I really stress you need to, when you're looking, there's national levels, there's state levels, and then there is more of your individual business plan, your individual philosophy. Who do you want to serve? What do you want your birth center to look like? So the whole point of licensing and regulations is about a consistency expectation. If a consumer is calling you and saying, I want a birth center delivery with a midwife, they can look on a state and national level and have a clear understanding and expectation of what a birth center looks like, what standards are you going to have in place for me, and what educational background and policies and the safety of the flow of the actual building in place. So every place is different, and I can't stress enough, it's not nearly as complicated as midwifery standards and educational pathways. You're looking at a facility, you're looking at zoning, you're looking at the layout of the building, you're making sure you have policies in place, you're making sure you have the staffing, training, the continuing education, the written or informal consulting and collaborating relationships with the local labor and delivery services, the local physicians. You really want want to be an integral bar to the community because that's what improves the outcomes. Those transfers many times are low key. It's for an epidural. It's um, she's slow to progress. She's fine. Baby's fine overall, but we need additional augmentation from the hospital facility. But if you get the situation where minutes matter, it's a rare serious emergency, we want to improve outcomes by having those strong quality improvement programs in place. <laughs> and following them and making sure our staff is fully aware of what they are. So there's different ways you can improve the standards and just addressing the following. So these are a lot of when you do a CABC or you look at the consistent themes of state regulations, there's very key things you're going to see. They're going to want you to talk about the scope of services. What do you do in your policies that the midwives practice independently? What do they collaborate with for physicians? And what do you refer out to a specialist a hospital delivery XYZ services? What is your philosophy of care? What's your mission? What's your value? What do you as the midwifery team offer to your families? Um, just the overall administration business stuff in the backdrops, the planning, the board, the legal structure, and how do you have it all set up in the backdrops? Human resources, that has to do with your training, your job description, your competencies, your protocols, um, your peer reviews, if there's a near miss, if there's quality evaluations. You want to make sure that you have the best care possible. You guys are doing practice drills. You're um, leaving room in your budget for the staff to have continuing education. You want to be able to do continual research. You want to make sure that the standards you're offering now are the same standards three years from now because evidence changes, guidelines change all the time, so you want to keep up with all those things. 
So there's birth center regulations and you just, I, I, the big thing I stress in here is most states have regulations, know them really well. On top of your midwifery regulations, you want to know this facility is set up the way that the national and state guidelines want you to structure them. So we talked about the key concepts. They're gonna look at your staffing, the layout of the building, the policies, the procedures. They wanna make sure you're gonna give safe care to the community long-term.